word and Luke chapter 12. Luke 12 and and beginning in verse 13. Our Lord, we pray that um, we would be filled with awe and wonder, uh, a sense of fear, but one that draws us to you, as when the people gathered around Mount Sinai and the voice of God thundered through the thunder, through the fire, the smoke. Lord, here we hear the voice of God in the Gospel of Luke, and we pray that we would hear um, the voice of the shepherd uh, instructing us and uh, cautioning and encouraging us as we read the word and as it is preached just now. Father, advance the work of your kingdom within. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so just uh, to remind you, um, Jesus had had his, um, one of his showdowns with the Pharisees and scribes. He'd had that awkward dinner. And then as he leaves, um, the crowd gather around and Jesus is concerned uh, that the threat uh, that he is facing that is going to then come upon the church would discourage them from being faithful to him. And last time we were talking about confess me before men. And so still the same setting um, and a voice from the crowd then cries out to Jesus. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your rest Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then, who, then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Amen. So there are two tactics, um, two principal tactics that the devil uh, uses to destroy our faith and to draw us from Christ. One of them is persecution. Um, and as I said, um, that's the first area that Jesus speaks to. Don't fear the one who's able to destroy the body. Fear God who's able to destroy body and soul in hell. And he says, confess me before men. Uh, even though they might do horrible things to you, confess me before men and know this, that the Son of Man is going to confess you before the angels. And so he addresses that, that first tactic um, that first attempt of the devil to uh, crush our faith. But the other way in which the devil seeks to um, attack us, and, and this is the principal way that he would seek to attack us here in the Western world and in England, a very prosperous nation, is with the allure of the world, uh, the draw of uh, the world with all of its uh, wealth and splendor and all that it presents as an opportunity to our souls and to our appetites. And in God's providence, um, Jesus is led on to this very helpfully by a man uh, who interrupts him as he is teaching. And the man wants Jesus to settle the dispute of, with his brother over his inheritance. Presumably his father has died and the estate has to be divided. And here Jesus sees in this man's heart, but notice he speaks to the whole crowd in verse 15, and he says, listen, all of you, I want you to know this. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Beware of covetousness. Beware of the allure 
of the world. But one of the things that I want to show you is that he doesn't just uh, warn us here not to hunger after and seek to be filled with the things of this world, uh, but he tells us the thing that we should hunger after, that we should seek to be filled with. And that's not with the world and not with that which the world can give to us, but to be hung to hunger after and to be filled with God. And this is the solution. This is the thing we need to be filled with God. He says at the conclusion of his address in verse 21, don't be rich in this world, but be rich towards God. Let God fill your life. Be rich with a view to God. Be, be rich with a view to God's standards and God's values. Be filled in your life. Be saturated with God himself as he comes to you in the gospel. So that's the uh, positive encouragement. Now, why? Why then should we be filled with God? First, uh, for peace amongst men. We're taken here into this very common dispute, as I say, over uh, inheritance. And how many times have we seen it? Uh, somebody dies and the family uh, devolve into a shameless uh, arguing and uh, into an anxiousness. Instead of a celebration of the life of the person who has so loved them and left them a great inheritance, they begin to think about their portion of the inheritance. What should be a time of remembrance um, becomes a time of hungering after cash and increased possessions. Um, this is a tale as old as time. And here it's happening. This man wants Jesus to come in and make a decision against his brother and see that he would receive the inheritance. Now, in a sense, he's come to the right man. Jesus judges with perfect judgment, with perfect discernment. Jesus can absolutely settle this dispute for the fella, but he doesn't. And in fact, Jesus, um, as the man comes to him, refuses in a rather abrupt way. He says to him, man, and in the way that you might say, what are you talking about? And this is what Jesus is saying to this man. What are you playing at here? You covenant child of Abraham coming to me and expecting me to judge this matter, expecting me to be like some executor over your father's estate? What are you playing at? I'm not going to have any part in this. Why? Why? And Jesus is actually making here a really important point. And the first point he is making is about the nature of his kingdom. The kingdoms of men, every single kingdom that has ever arisen, that is ruled by men, sets in place administrations and law and the enforcement of law in order to restrain the evil of men, in order to settle the disputes and the squabbles of men. But Jesus is saying, my kingdom is nothing like this. My kingdom is not just one kingdom amongst many. Mine is the kingdom to consume and is supremely higher than every kingdom. My kingdom works from the inside out. My kingdom is a kingdom of transformation that takes the heart of man and works just there and then out into the community of men and out into this world such that when my kingdom is finished, there'll be no squabbles for me to mediate over because your heart will be perfect. And because this is the direction of travel, this is the priority of Jesus. The process of the kingdom coming on earth, which happens through the renewal of the heart. This is more important to Christ than any earthly concern and the settling of any human affair. An executor, though they, and they have a legitimate role, would say, okay, so here's what we're going to do here. We're going to look at the objective facts of the case before us, and I'm going to make a particular ruling. But that's not what Jesus does. Jesus says to the man and says to the crowds, in such situations, the first place you must go is to the heart. That's where we must go. That's where the priority has to be. What is in the heart? Beware of covetousness. And you see, one of the reasons that Jesus takes us there is not only because the heart is the means by which the kingdom is coming on earth, but the heart is the means by which the peace of the kingdom will be established on earth. Think about it like this. The man 
could go to Christ, he could make a ruling in the case. There is some objective reality there, isn't there, that has to be settled. The inheritance is fairly going to be given to one brother, to the other, or divided in some particular ratio. Christ could make a judgment like that. The man could go off and he could get himself a really good lawyer, and the man would settle the case. But in the process of settling this external matter, what is at risk for this man? He could lose his brother in the process. He so pursued what was right externally that he lost the relationship with his own brother. In the process, as Jesus is going to go on to show, this man could lose his own soul before God and everything that he had ever thought to gain in the end would go to mush. But what if, what if this son of Abraham would seek first to be rich before God? What if this son of Abraham, instead of thinking of the outward estate as the primary concern, would think about his heart and his standing before the Lord? And it's precisely this that Jesus does for him. Jesus says, man, don't you worry about these things. Don't worry about your inheritance. The thing that you need to think about in this situation and in every situation like it first and foremost is your heart. What is your heart doing at a moment like this? What is it that is motivating you? And he might say, well, it's a sense of justice and it's a sense of doing the thing that is right. But Jesus is saying, ah, but is there not something else that is going on in that heart? Is there not greed? Is there not a hungering for the things of this world such that you would prioritize them over the relationship with your brother, over the relationship that you have with God? And if this man had stopped to consider his heart before God, before pursuing his legal options, is it not the case that the peace of the future kingdom might just have broken through into the present? And as he stopped and he thought, you know, I've grown up with this man. And we're here to remember the, the great man that my, my father was. Would he not turn to his brother and say to him, this is silly. I don't need any of this. You matter more to me than a thousand fields. I'm not for a moment suggesting that there's never a time to seek what is right. But what I am saying is that the heart is to be the priority. And then people, and lastly, things. When the heart is the priority, the relationship with people will go the way it's supposed to go. And then we can worry about things. But we, we turn the case upside down. I can guarantee you this, that you have never in your life ever had a blameless dispute. And every single, uh, every single time in which you have been crossed or you have been wronged or you've had to settle some administration, whatever it is, you have never ever had a single pure dispute. Every single time there has been somewhere within your heart some, some greed, some hatred, some pride. Now what if instead of seeking what was right first, you examined your heart before God? What if before settling the earthly justice, your concern was that your heart would be filled with God? Wouldn't that change everything? If you go back over all of the ways in which you have fallen out with people, the ways that have been bitter and painful in the past, had you first lifted up your heart to Christ as he is there in the heavens and said, Christ, by your spirit, I want you to expose and I want you to show me first what must change within me before I change my outward outward circumstances, would you not then have greater peace amongst men? Would you not then have a heart that has moved closer to God? The more that you live before God, the greater your peace will be amongst men. Be filled with God. Let that be your concern. First and foremost, it is the heart. Then it is relationship. And then it is things. Always get the priority right. Be filled with God that you would have peace amongst men. Be filled with God that you would not be consumed by death. This is my second point. And you might think, well, that sounds a bit extreme. We need to be so 
filled and saturated with God, that we would not be consumed by death. Remember what we're told in Genesis chapter 3 about death. Death is not first and foremost something that is natural. It's not first and foremost the stopping of the heart. Death is a separation uh, from God. Death is a broken relationship with God. The God who is supposed to fill us no longer fills us. This, this is spiritual death. And the great problem here is that if it is not God who fills us, then we will never be filled. If God does not fill us, we can never be filled. If we are not rich towards God, there is a black hole at the center of our being. And this is the source of, of greed. This is the source of the avarice that Jesus calls out here amongst the people, the greed uh, that wreaks havoc with our life and, and turns us to death. Greed is the corruption of that natural hungering and thirsting for God in seeking all that is not God. That's what greed is. We're looking to satisfy ourselves with God, with everything that is not God. And Jesus says in verse 15, a man's life does not consist in this. This is no way to live. This is a certain death. This is the realm of death. This is the principle of death within you. And I want to show you exactly, he says, where all of this will lead. If you allow greed to be that thing which drives a satisfaction apart from God in anything else, I want you to know where this is going to lead. First and foremost, this is going to lead uh, to this place where you uh, discover enough will never be enough. Enough will never be enough for you. Here is the man in the parable, and he's rich. He's really rich in verse 16, and he's just got richer. He's had this great, uh, abundant crop, and he has so much in verse 17 to 18 that he doesn't know what to, know what to do with it. I'm rich, and I've just become even richer. What am I going to do? My barns are full. I know what I'll do. I'll tear them down, and I'll build even more. But note this. Why does he do it? What's his reason? It comes out, doesn't it, in verse 19, when he says, I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your rest, eat, drink, and be merry. But you notice that the man still has no rest within his life. He believes with all of his abundance, now he's got this even greater abundance, finally he'll be at rest. Finally he can be at ease and he can eat and drink and be merry. It's interesting that the word that is used there to be at ease, to be at rest, is the same one that Jesus uses when he says, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You see this man, he's not found any rest in God, and so he is restless in his life. And in one hand, it's like, it's totally absurd, because most people would have lived in the first century, and most Christians and most of the covenant community in relative poverty. They'd have had a single room dwelling. They'd have had two garments of clothing if they were lucky. And they'd have looked to this man the first time round and thought, look at this man. He has barns full of treasures. This man is blessed. This man is rich. He has more than we could ever dream of. And yet, astonishingly, the man is still anxious. He's still looking for something more. He still doesn't believe that he has quite enough to be at rest, to be happy in this life. And that makes total sense. Why? Because if that big black hole within our life is made to be filled with the infinite, majestic, eternal, and incomprehensible God, it cannot be filled with anything else. Happiness will always evade you. It's a terrible thing, this greed. Uh, I've suffered with it throughout my life and had addictions to sort of needing to, uh, to get one more thing, uh, to buy another book, uh, to buy some new clothes, to buy a new guitar. And you keep telling yourself, well, if I could just get this thing, then I'll be happy. If I can get the next thing, well, then, then I'll be happy. And actually, when you see it, and um, you, can see, you see it in certain children, 
like I, I see it and I, w- I won't say in who, but I see it in, in, in one of my, my kids. And no matter what they have, they're always worried about what they don't have. No matter what they, what they have, they, they can't enjoy it because they're thinking immediately about the next thing that they need to have. They're seeking the fullness of God in that which is not God. And so they never find their satisfaction. The great tragedy of all of this is that if you are permitted to be wealthy, if you are permitted to be so blessed with material goods, you are driven into an intolerable and unbearable nothingness. And this is what happens, and I've mentioned it before, uh, to those uh, who reach the top. Because they say, well, if I can just earn a little bit more, if I can have a few more million in the bank, if I can buy the next yacht, if I can buy this remarkable home, well, then surely I'll be happy. They're chasing God in all that is not God. But what happens is when they reach the top and they have that abundance and they can buy anything their heart could possibly desire, they have that awful realization that none of this can satisfy. And then it is only despair. And then it is self-murder and suicide. Enough will never be enough. Only God is enough. Nothing will last. In verse 20, Jesus says this man's life, like all of our lives, will suddenly, unexpectedly be brought to an end. His soul will be summoned before God. And then he says, and everything that he has amassed, then who will it belong to? This man has labored and he's torn down his barn and he's going to build another one. But then his, his life is called home before God and everything is going to turn to dust. You can work through your life. You can build and you can buy and you can collect. But your life is short and in the end, everything will turn to ruin. Are we ready to make our whole precious life about absolute nothing? Is that what you want? You want to live your life and everything you chased, everything you thought was valuable is just going to go to nothing. None of it is going to endure beyond this world and into eternity. None of it is going to last. This is that principle of death. If God is not filling our life, enough will never be enough for us. Nothing we chase will ever last. Our lives will be meaningless. But most importantly, we will be unprepared for God. He says, you fool this night, your soul is required of you in verse 20. And he talks about the man's soul as a debt that is owed to God. He tells us here that the creation, our lives, our souls belong to God. They are sent forth from God and they are to be returned to God. They are from God and they are for God. And you might think to yourself, well, I don't want my life to be for God. I don't want to return and increase to him. And isn't it kind of selfish because we think God thinks like a man, but it's not selfish at all. And clearly you have not understood your life and what it is you are seeking. In some sense, all mankind has ever wanted is God. Everything has been made in this world to reveal aspects of who God is his goodness, his beauty, his knowledge, his, his truth. And the whole idea is that those things that delight us, that we, we chase after, were meant to move us by degrees up into the being of God. As I mentioned in my prayer at the beginning, God has perfect blessedness. God, before he creates, is perfectly happy, perfect love within the three persons of the Godhead. The only reason that he makes us, the only reason he gives a rational soul to us is what? that we would share in that blessedness, that we would share in that delight. God wants to draw us into himself. The greatest gift that he has given is that we would know him and that we would share him as he shares himself with us. This is the entire point of our life. This is the end of our life. This is our highest good. And this man has totally blown it. Instead of his life, And the blessings that he has received leading him up to God and him increasing and having this delight in the most delightful God 
It's turned him in on himself. There's a reason Paul, throughout the epistles, calls covetousness idolatry. When we have this, this greed and this appetite, which is used not to lead us into the divine being, not to lead us into the likeness of God, we have turned the creation order upside down and we have made ourselves to be God, pathetic, weak, and pointless gods. And this man has done this. He has made himself an idol. Look how there is this stress on himself and the personal interest throughout in verse 17. He thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? He said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and I will build greater and there I will store all my crops and my goods and I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink and be merry. These things that were to lead him into the being of God, he has made them all about himself and so he ex ex excluded God from his life. And he has rejected the privileged position he was in to share the likeness of God on the earth. Remember, he, God made man, Adam and Eve, to be his image bearers. Was this man guilty because he was rich? Absolutely not. The man had been exalted by God. But what was he to do with that wealth? He'd been lifted up on the earth to become like God. As God pours himself out as the Lord Jesus Christ who was rich but makes himself poor, pours himself out that through his poverty we would become rich. This man has the opportunity to be just like God, to take his possessions, to look up and to adore the God who has given them and then to pour them out into the lives of others. But instead, having rejected richness to God, being driven by this greed and black hole. He has nothing to return to God. This night he says, your soul is required of you. And God will look at this man's soul and see there is no love for God in the man. And there is no love for his fellow man to be found. And so this man who has driven God out of his life will by God be driven from the life of God into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. The question for you is this. What will he say to you? When your life comes to an end, that life that he has given and that he is sustaining moment by moment, when he draws it out from your fleshly body and he presents that soul before him, will he find there a deep love of God and a love for your fellow man? Or will he find nothing but a dead idol and will he drive it from his presence? Now again, remember where we started. If we are rich towards God, if, if God so fills our life, then we'll have less of this hole that we seek to fill with with all that is not God. Remember that Jesus is telling the parable that there would be a course correction amongst this great crowd that have gathered. There would be a course correction in the life of this man. Do you see this? If, if you cannot say that your life is rich with God, you will not have peace amongst men and you will be consumed by this principle of death. And so we need to seek this richness with God. If that is death, then richness with God is life. Your life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions. Your life is in this, says the Lord, my third and final and brief point, verse 21. It's not treasuring up riches for yourself, but it is in being rich towards God. This is what it means to live. And the more that you live this life, the more you will enjoy your life, the fuller, the richer your life will be. So how can we be rich towards God? How, how can God so fill our lives? Well, first we need to understand and seek God as the treasure of our life. 
That's what we need to know. He alone can satisfy and fill us. We go after so many other things every day. We get distracted. We forget God, but we need to understand and know that God alone can satisfy our soul. And so we're going to hunger for him. So we're going to search his word. So we're going to take time in prayer. So we're going to meet with the community of his people that our lives would be soaked in the divine life. And maybe you'll say, I've been doing this for a while and I've been trying, but I just, I have no taste for it anymore. Well then, cry out all the more. Oh God, please fill my life. Why? Because I know that if you do not fill it, it will never be filled. If you do not fill it, then it is despair and death and it's out of darkness for me. I need you to fill my life. And so, let God be the treasure of your life, the pursuit of your day every single day. Children to grown-ups, let God fill your life. Be rich in God. Be rich in the knowledge of God. Be rich in the love of God. Be rich in the service of God. Imitate God in your life. He has made you for this. He has made you to be his image bearers. To use your life for anything else is like using the wrong tool for the wrong job. It's like trying to saw wood with a hammer. Can you imagine sawing a block of wood with the smooth head of the hammer? And imagine if your face was that smooth head of the hammer and you're being rubbed across the coarse and splintery wood and you're making absolutely no progress. That's what our life is. Do you never feel your life is just like that? You're making no progress. You are advancing in no sense. You have no satisfaction. You have no peace within. Why? Because you are taking this tool and you are using it to the wrong end. Your tool, your life, your soul is there that you would imitate God. That you would be enriched by God, but then you would begin to be like God. Beware of covetousness. It creeps into the life of all. There is an absolute sense in which this black hole opens up. And there is a relative sense within the life of the believer in which this black hole opens up. But ask yourself, step back each day and ask yourself the question, is it really God who satisfies and thrills me? Is it really God that I'm seeking after today? Is it really God that I am pursuing with my time and choices or have those little Amazon parcels that come through the post box become the joy of my day? Has leisure, has food, has, self has selfish interest crept in? Are these things the joy of my day, the joy of my week, the joy of my month, the joy of my life? Then I will have no joy. Is it God that really satisfies me? That's the question to ask yourself each day, morning and night, if I pursued him, if I don't pursue him, then I'll never be filled. I'll never be happy. I'll never enter his kingdom. God, relationships above all else. Life's not in the abundance of possessions, but in relationship. Relationship first with God and then with man. How often have you allowed some material concern, material advantage or disadvantage to interrupt and disturb your relationship with another creature made in God's image? Relationship comes first before things. And finally, the heart. The heart comes first before outcomes. Before even just outcomes, the heart is to be the great burden of your consciousness. Let every tension and every falling out take you first to your own heart before God. Don't worry about what is right. Worry about what is right or wrong within your heart. Lift it up to God. have Christ point to what needs to change. You'll gain far more in the process. A purer soul, more peaceable walk with man. The heart is mad matters more than outcomes. And you do these things and you will be rich towards God. You will repel the allure of the world. And you'll live a rich 
and rewarding life now and in the kingdom that is to come. And so be rich towards God.